Tonight we'll be looking at biblical manuscripts confirm the Bible can be trusted. This, of course, is a very important um, topic to consider um, for anyone considering the Bible. As this was originally um, was this um, is what is is what was originally written the Word of God. And is the Bible that we have in front of us the same text that was written thousands of years ago? Have people altered the text to suit their own needs? Have some simply been too lazy to check the text has been copied correctly? Has the continuous copying and recopying of the text gradually added errors over the centuries? Is it like a, a game of Chinese whispers where the original message, f- uh, phrase or word is uh, drastically different to the one that comes out uh, at the other end, which I'm sure you can see would be the natural result of copying and copying over thousands of years. This question is, of course, of very high importance for anyone considering the Word of God, and especially if you are planning on basing your life around uh, the principles set out in the Bible. Tonight, I'll be structuring um, the talk as follows. Firstly, we'll um, have a brief look at what is called the biographical test. What is it and how we can use it tonight? Um, <clears throat> then we'll have a look at how the New Testament um, compares to other manuscripts of a similar age. We'll have a look at the amount of manuscripts, how many that we have available for us um, to compare to, uh, the timing of the manuscripts, um, how long it has been since the original writings of the manuscript, uh, the, uh, the original copy until the earliest manuscripts we have. We'll look at the quotations from the early church fathers and compare them to the manuscripts um, we have uh, today. We'll have a brief look at the historical accuracy of these manuscripts, um, which, would be, which would have been lost with any meddling with the text. Then we'll have a look at the uh, Old Testament manuscripts, and again we'll be looking at the timing of the manuscripts and how long there was between the original, uh, when the original was written and the earliest copies we have. Uh, Then we'll have a look at uh, the tribal uh, scribal tradition of copying the text, which puts uh, significant emphasis on the accurate copying of the texts. Um, And then finally, we'll have a uh, look at the very famous finds of manuscripts, um, that is, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we'll have a brief look at the common criticisms of the validity of the Bible manuscripts, and then um, some of the linguistic proofs uh, contained in the manuscripts. When examining um, manuscripts, one of the most common tests which is used to determine if the corruption of the text has occurred through time is called the biographical test. We'll consider the application of this test in two parts. Um, That is, how many uh, manuscripts do we have and what differences there are between them. Large discrepancies between ancient manuscripts would indicate uh, textual corruption um, has occurred during the copying process. And then what time interval between the original and the oldest copies we have. If the gap is larger, um, then there is more room for corruption to enter into the text. And if the gap is shorter, then there's less room for for corruption to enter into the text. We'll firstly apply this to the New Testament and then to the Old Testament manuscripts. So the first thing you'll notice when examining the New Testament manuscripts is there is a very large number of surviving New Testament manuscripts and in several languages. The following um, table shows just how much variety we have in the languages of the manuscripts. The items listed under the Greek column are simply uh, the varying styles of writing and the different materials to write with. And so you can see we have quite an enormous um, number of manuscripts and manuscripts in many, many languages. And in total, we have uh, over 24,000 surviving New Testament manuscripts. Uh, These manuscripts range in dates from um, quite early on in the first um, century 
to into the Middle Ages. Uh, in comparison to this, we have many manuscripts from other writings from long gone history, some of which I've put on the, on the screen now. And it is quite interesting to note that all these well-known classics of ancient literature, there are very few um, ancient manuscripts. For instance, Herodotus' history is a famous book, yet there are only eight manuscripts, uh, manuscript copies in existence. Yet while critics are quick to doubt the reliability of the New Testament, they are much far less likely to question the reliability of Herodotus' history. Another uh, good example of this uh, is that of Homer's Iliad, which is a manuscript with the second most amount of, of uh, manuscript copies we have, that is second uh, to the New Testament. Homer um, was the most widely read author in antiquity, and the Iliad was his most popular work. However, the number of copies of the Iliad, when compared against the number of copies of the New Testament, is seen to be very, very small indeed, as you can quite clearly see um, from this chart on the PowerPoint tonight. It is um, quite interesting to make some comparisons between the New Testament and Homer's Iliad in terms of the, also the number of variations uh, between ancient manuscript copies, as the following quotations uh, indicate. The New, Te New Testament has about 20,000 lines. The Iliad has about 15,600. Uh, Only about 40 lines, about 400 words in the New Testament are in doubt, Where, whereas 764 lines of the Iliad are questions, questioned. This 5% textual corruption compares with the one half uh, percent of similar emendations in the New Testament. It is also important to note that the variations that have been made in the New Testament manuscripts typically do not change uh, the meaning of the text as shown uh, on the slide. Oops. About 19 twentieths uh, of the New Testament textual variations are of so little importance that their adoption or rejection would cause no appreciable difference in the sense of the passage where they occur. Hence the New Testament we read today has almost no difference between it and most ancient manuscripts, uh, manuscript copies uh, that we have available uh, to us today. And this, of course, gives us a very high level of confidence that there has been minimal change to the text of the New Testament from the earliest um, known copies till today. It is also important to look at the time gap uh, between the date of writing of the New Testament and the earliest copies that we have. The smaller the gap between the uh, date a book was written and the earliest copy of the book that was uh, the earliest copy of that book, the less time there has been for changes, manipulations, or corruption. But very fortunately for us, um, the New Testament again has by far the best uh, credentials compared to all other ancient works. The time gap between the date of writing and the earliest manuscript copies is only 30 years for some manuscripts. This compares to the ones that I have on the screen now. As you can see, those like Homer's Iliad has about 500 years between authorship and the earliest copies. And there's 13, 1,300 years between the authorship and the earliest copies of Herodotus's history. As discussed above, there are a large number of ancient manuscripts from the New Testament. The following is a brief list of some of, of the more uh, significant ones, where and when they were found. Um, the first is, was, is dated from the year 130, and it's the John Ryland manuscript. And if you're interested, you can see this on display at the John Ryland Library at the University of Manchester. Uh, the next one is the uh, Diatessaron, uh, which is a small portion of a harmony of the four Gospels, and this was written about the year 160. 
the next one is uh, Bod the Bodmir Papyrus, and this was written circa uh, 150. And this contained sections from the uh, book of uh, the Gospels of Luke and John, and also the epistles of Peter and Jude. Then we have the Chester um, Papyri, which can ca contains the four Gospels, Acts, and uh, several other sections of Scripture. And then we have the Codex Vaticanus from uh, circa 325. And this is virtually the entire uh, Bible. And this uh, is housed in the Vatican Library uh, in, in the Vatican. And then there is uh, various other manuscripts written in various different languages, um, many of which I haven't put on there. So you can see we have many, many manuscript, manuscripts um, where the gap between the time writing and the copies that we have today is a much shorter period than any other <coughs> manuscript of the times. On top of this, we have the Church Fathers. The Church Fathers were um, writers who uh, wrote in the first four centuries after Christ's, um, Christ's death. They were a number of men who were quite prominent among the believers and who wrote many letters, books and other documents in which they quoted extensively, extensively from both the New and Old Testaments. These men are known, um, as I said before, as the church, church fa uh, Christian fathers, sorry. And many of these manuscripts these men wrote, we still have copies of today. And due to the many, many quotations by the uh, Christian fathers, we can find yet more proof of the credibility of the text we have in front of us. I've put, on, uh, I've put a table on the screen um, of the number of quotations from the New Testament in some of these writings. And as you can see, there are many, many quotations um, throughout the Christian Fathers, totaling more than uh, 36,000 quotations. And just in case you're wondering what the historians think about this, um, of all these quotations of the Christian Fathers, I've got a few quotes um, that indicate their position. Uh, first is, quotations of the, of the scripture in the works of the early Christian writers are so extensive that the New Testament could virtually be reconstructed from them without the use of the New Testament manuscripts. And then Bruce um, Metzer says, indeed, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources of our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. And just to round it out, um, I've got another quote from Sir David um, de Rimple. As I possess uh, all the existing, as I possess all the existing works of the fathers for the second and third centuries, I commenced to search, and up to this time I have found the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. And his conclusion, if the New Testament were a collaboration of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. Hence, the evidence for the reliability of the New Testament is very impressive. The evidence for, the evidence for its reliability is far stronger than any other ancient book we have. And therefore, we can be very sure that what we read in the New Testament today is almost exactly what the authors originally wrote. So now um, we'll move on to the historical accuracy of the uh, New Testament. About a century ago, um, Sir William Ramsey, a well-known archaeologist from the uh, late 1800s, set about to disprove the New Testament's historical record. This um, renowned scholar, when faced with the archaeological evidence, was compelled to conclude that the New Testament writer, Luke, ranked among the greatest historians of all time. His thorough research and conclusions were published in a series of highly regarded books. He found that the, author knew of, the authors knew of things to a high degree of accuracy that could not be the case if the books were written in a date later than it claimed to be. These pieces of information would be incorrect 
as the author would impose their own culture, background and language onto the stories they wrote. I put a list of things on the slide that are considered to prove that the Bible is historically accurate. So we have the correct geographical and political ideas. This includes the provinces, regions and cities mentioned throughout the book of Acts. Um, there's also accurate knowledge of the intimate, uh, intimate local customs. This includes the speech of the Lyconians, uh, the foreign women in Ath Athens, and the local title for the uh, Ephesian uh, uh, temple keeper of Artemis. There's also accurate knowledge of different local offices. This includes the proconsul of Cyprus in Acts, uh, the magistrates at Philippi, the polytarchs at Thess uh, Thessalonica, and the proconsul at Achaia, and Erastus at Corinth, and many, many others. There is accurate knowledge of events. This includes the events such as the, time, the famine at the time of Claudius. There is accurate knowledge of religious practices. This includes the uh, worship of Zeus and Hermes uh, together at Lystra and Diana of the Ephesians. There's also accurate knowledge of the detail of legal procedure. Uh, this includes the trial in the market of Philippi and uh, oh, there's also accurate knowledge about local buildings and areas. Um, this also includes the marketplace at Philippi, the gate and river at Philippi, the marketplace at Athens, the Acropolis at Athens, um, the trial in the market at Athens, the theatre at Ephesus, and Diana's temple at Ephesus. So I think we can all agree that the accurate knowledge of the times and events when... Uh, when the books were written, uh, means that any forgery would have easily be de detectable. And any significant alterations to the text would also be easily identifiable. So we've now considered the evidence of the reliability of the New Testament. Now we'll look at the evidence of the reliability of the Old Testament. Firstly, we'll look at um, some of the ancient manuscripts of the Old Testament. I've put the... Um, manuscripts of, the mo of most importance to us on the screen of the Old Testament. This includes the Samaritan text, which is the, contains the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. Then there's the Septuagint, um, around 250 BC. This is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, undertaken in, en masse by slaves in Egypt. And then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I'll be talking about later on. Um, this contained over 40,000 fragments from many Old Testament books. And this, that was written um, from 200 BC to about the year zero. Uh, then we also have the scroll of Isaiah, a complete Hebrew scroll of the prophecy of Isaiah, uh, dated to around 125 BC. And then we have a, a, a papyrus citing the Ten Commandments, dating from 100 AD. And then probably the uh, one that's, um, well, sorry, one that is of quite interest to us is the Masoretic text. Um, this is a Hebrew text of the entire Old Testament, <coughs> ratified by the council in Jamnia. Uh, the council in Jamnia was a Jewish council brought together to define which books um, were to be accepted in the Old Testament and which were not. It was actually already well established at this point um, which books were inspired and which books weren't, but this was more of a, a clear statement to say which books would be considered part of the canon and which ones wouldn't. And this text um, uh, makes up what a large portion of what is in front of us today. And so it goes on yet again. We can see that there is, once again, many Old Testament manuscripts to choose from, which... Uh, together de demonstrates the validity of the text that we have in front of us. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls are probably the um, most important discovery in archaeology in regard to the Bible manuscripts. They were found in 1947 by a Bedouin shepherd boy um, who discovered a large number of jars in a cave uh, on the west side of the Dead Sea. In these jars were scrolls 
which had deteriorated and broken up over time. However, eventually some 40,000 fragments were taken from this cave and other caves around the area, and more than 500 books uh, were reconstructed from these well-preserved scrolls. Among these scrolls are many of the books of the Old Testament. These scrolls, uh, sorry, yeah, these scrolls were hidden by Jews um, from an exclu excluded religious community near Qumran in around the year uh, 68 AD in order to stop the Roman invaders um, from destroying them. And this makes these scrolls roughly around 2,000 years old. So what uh, significance is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Many of the Dead Sea Scrolls date from around 100 BC and are the oldest Hebrew uh, Old Testament manuscripts we have. And it's therefore um, very important to us to check the validity of the text we have in front of us. So the big question is, what were the differences found between the manuscripts from the Dead Sea and the previously found manuscripts that make up the Bible that is in front of us? And the answer is quite simply, there's very few minor differences. Uh, the two texts are almost identical. It is also important to mention at this point that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain fragments from every book except one, um, but didn't contain any hidden or extra biblical books, meaning that not only is the Bible in front of us accurate, but no book um, is missing out of the canon due to being lost over time. The Dead Sea Scrolls and other ancient Hebrew texts have very little difference to the text of the Old Testament that we have today. But it, is of, but it is of interest to consider how this is. Why haven't errors been written into the text with the repeated copying over the centuries? Uh, one clear reason for this is the Jews have always regarded the process of copying out uh, the Old Testament as a process requiring great care and great time. The following are the rules um, specified in the Talmud for the copying out of the Hebrew uh, scriptures. And for those who aren't aware, the Talmud is a um, Jewish commentary on the Hebrew scriptures and includes many rules and directions for the Drew, uh, Jews, including those um, about copying out the text. These rules uh, include a synagogue must, a synagogue role must be written on skins of clean animals. The rolls must be prepared for the synagogue uh, uh, by a Jew. The skins must be fastened with uh, strings taken from clean animals. Every skin must contain a certain number of columns equal throughout. The length of each column uh, must extend uh, over less than 48 uh, lines. Uh, sorry, the length of each column must extend between 48 and 60 lines. The whole copy must be first lined, and if, th uh, three words, uh, uh, if three words be written without a line, it is considered worthless. The ink shall be black and no other colour, and shall be prepared according to a definite recipe. An authentic copy must be the exemplar or example, um, from which the transcriber ought to uh, not deviate in the least. No word or letter must be read, uh, written from memory. Um, between every consonant, um, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every section, the breadth of nine consonants must intervene. Between every book, three lines must inter intervene. And the, uh, the, the fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly um, with a completed line. Beside this, the copyist must sit in full Jewish dress, dress, wash his body before commencement, and not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink. And should a king address him while, he, while writing that name, he must, not, uh, must take no notice of him. So you can see the importance these scribes are placed on their copying. And therefore, the copies uh, would have less mistakes, both directly from some of these rules, 
and also indirectly from the extreme emphasis these rules um, put on the copying of the text without uh, fault. On top of these rules were another set of rules put in place by the um, Masoretes who began in about 100 AD to control the standard of uh, the standard text for the Hebrew Bible. They made many additional rules, as uh, Sir Frederick um, uh, Kenyon states. Besides recording varieties of readings, the Masoretes undertook a number of calculations which did not enter into the ordinary sphere of textual criticism. They numbered the verses, words, and letters of every book. They calculated the middle word and the middle letter of each. They enumerated verses which contained all the letters of the alphabet, or all certain, or a certain number of them, and so on. These trivialities, as we might right, rightly consider them, had yet the effect of securing minute attention to the precise transmission of the text. And they are but an extensive manifestation of a respect for the sacred scriptures, which in itself deserves nothing but praise. The Masoretes uh, were indeed anxious that not one jot nor tittle, not one smallest letter, nor any tiny part of a letter of the law should pass away or be lost. So again, we can see we have more rules um, set up, which will make the text yet more reliable. The next thing we probably need to consider is the many and growing number of critics of the Old Testament. These critics have criticised many things, but in particular the historical details of the Old Testament, such as the names of kings, the existence of cities, and whether um, writing was uh, even invented by Abraham's time. And of course, all of these um, criticism, criticisms have their answers. The first is the belief that the events um, from Abraham's era could not be recorded, as writing had not been invented by this time. However, in 1974, a relevant archaeological find was unearthed. Professor uh, Matt Haye and uh, uh, Panato were excavating Telmatic in northern Syria which discovered some 17,000 tablets from the Ebla kingdom. Ebla, at, it, at the height of its um, reign, was, a, sorry, Ebla, at its height in 2300 BC, had a population of 26, uh, sorry, 260,000 people. As Abraham lived only 2,000 years before Christ, it is quite obvious that writing was not only invented by Abraham's time, but in fact we have definitive proof it was invented 300 years before um, Abraham lived. And not only was the, uh, was the Bible correct about the fine details, such as when writing was invented, but also with many other details, both in regard to the cultures in which the Bible was written, as well as the cultures surrounding the area which the Bible was written in. As Professor R. R. Wilson says, the whole fabric of the his historic structure of the Old Testament har harmonises beautifully in general outline and often in detail with the background of the general history of the world as, regarded, as revealed in the documents from the nations surrounding Israel. <clears throat> Not only that, the, nation, the names of countries and kings that are recorded in the Old Testament are not, uh, not only are correct, but also have the exact same spelling as those in the archaeological finds. In one case, 24 names of the kings of Egypt, Assyria and Babylon are found together. In all, they contain 120 consonants, exactly as other reliable sources have them. As Dr. Wilson, a well-known author on the topic, writes, that the names should have been transmitted to us uh, through so many copying and so so many centuries is so complete a state of preservation is a phenomenon unequal in the history of literature. 
This incredible accuracy of transmission of King's names and other features indicates that the authors either were contemporary or had uh, very reliable original documents and that the scriptures were copied almost perfectly uh, to result in the perfect transmission of the names over the centuries. <clears throat> now, critics have also um, claimed that many books of the Old Testament were not written um, when they were supposed to be, when they claimed to have been written. However, there is some, uh, significant linguistic evidence to disprove uh, these critics. I'll only be spending a short time on uh, the linguistic arguments, as while they are very, as while they are very compelling, they are quite complex and take um, quite a long time to step through. And I'm sure um, you can look into these further yourselves in your own time. At the time at which any document was written can generally generally be determined by the vocabulary and what is termed linguistic characteristics. As you can probably see today, words and language change over time. A few of these changes we have in English today, and I've got three examples here for you. The, f uh, the first instance, uh, the first example I've got here is the word awful, which is now um, used to describe something disgusting. But the word awful is derived from the Old English word meaning awe, um, which at the time meant fear, uh, terror, or dread. Then after the production of the first Bible, awful changed its meaning to solemn and uh, uh, reverent, reverential wonder. But now, of course, its meaning has changed yet again to how we use it today. So any person reading the text and wanting to know when it was written would be able to use the word awful to give a rough indication of when the text was written and therefore detect any text claiming to be written in an era that is different to what it was written in. Uh, another example of this, word, uh, this kind of thing is the word naughty. Back in the 1300s, naughty was used for people who had nothing, thus the naught part of the word. Then in the fifth, uh, sorry, 1400s, the word naughty took on a more metaphorical sense and people started using the word naughty to speak of people who were wicked uh, or morally bankrupt and therefore considered worthless. And today the meaning has changed it again to mean uh, just someone who is disobedient. And our final example is the word nice. Up until the 1600s, nice meant someone who was ignorant, someone who didn't know as much as they probably should. Then it changed to someone who was uh, meticulous, attentive and sharp. Uh, then later on in the 18th century, it gained the current meaning of someone who is agreeable. So based on these examples, if we uh, came across a text that used each of these words in a particular manner, um, we could work out roughly the time of writing of the text. And of course, any addition to the text or forgery may be identified based on the uses of these words. Dr. William uh, Schneidwind, a professor at UCLA in Near East and Semantic Languages, comments on the attempts of late writers trying to claim uh, later writers trying to claim to be writing in archaic or classic Hebrew, as he remarks. One oft uh, misconception is that later writers uh, could accurately imitate earlier linguistic exemplars, which once again is examples. To be sure, there are examples of late scribes imitating earlier styles, but these imitations are always just that, imitations. Ancient scribes did not have the historical or ling linguistic tools to imitate early uh, text artefacts with complete precision. Linguists who are proponents of linguistic dating claim that archaizing is, is quite transparent. Based on these critics, based, based on this, critics often try to claim the Bible was either fraudulently uh, written or has been adjusted over time to suit later beliefs. One, probably the most common example of this is um, throughout the book of Chronicles um, where there is a mix of pre-exilic pre Hebrew, that is the Hebrew that was characteristic of the time before um, the Jews went to Babylon and post-exilic he Hebrew, 
that is the um, Hebrew that is characteristic of the time after the, the Jews came back from Babylon. And therefore, the critics say, Chronicles is a forgery. However, a close examination of this claim um, not only throws doubt on it, it uh, very quickly it, 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 um, quite quickly uh, crumbles away. As a simple consideration of the times uh, of the Book of Chronicles, um, records would indicate, as we've got a, we know a few things about the Book of Chronicles. Firstly, before, uh, before the Jews le went to Babylon, they left in a hurry because they were taken into captivity and taken away by force. Um, when they returned from Babylon under Ezra, they had no detailed record of their history. Much of the events recorded in the Chronicles would have been the day-to-day -day business of the king and would uh, be too large and uh, be unusual uh, for the history of the Jews. And lastly, the final two verses of Chronicles are almost identical to the first two verses of Ezra. So it would seem um, the author was trying... Uh, so it would seem the author was trying to tie it to the um, beginning of the book of Ezra. And this is in fact actually what most scholars believe that um, Chronicles was a bit written by, the, by Ezra. So the only rational explanation would be that Ezra edited and compiled the Chronicles and therefore it naturally contains both the original pre-exilic Hebrew from the original uh, recordings and the edits by Ezra uh, post-exilic contain post-exilic Hebrew. So no foul play has been used. And this is common to all the criticism based on linguistics. There is always a simple explanation as to why varied Hebrew styles are used. This would not be the case with uh, manuscripts smattered with errors or, man or manipulations as the changes would contain Hebrew with characteristics from the wrong times and words would be used incorrectly. However, very few examples of this, of this can be found throughout scripture and therefore we can conclude that the text we have in front of us was both written when it claims to be and has remained largely the same since it was authored. The other interesting point uh, from ling linguistics uh, of the Bible is the use of loan words or words which have been loaned from other languages and used in the Bible. Uh, this, results, this is a result of the authors, authors incorporating language from their background and uh, cultures and countries that they lived in. As you can see from the slide, um, we have many examples of the use of loan words in scripture. We have Joseph who used uh, Egyptian words as he lived, in a large part, lived a large part of his life in Egypt. Solomon who had wives um, from many, many countries um, used Indian, Assyrian and Hittite words uh, in his writings. Daniel, Nehemiah, Esther and also in the book of Chronicles. Persian words are used as they are written in a Persian context. Uh, Ezra, Daniel and Jeremiah also use Aramaic as this was the language used for much of the uh, commerce and government and government communications around the time of the exile of the Jews to Babylon. So we can see that the Bible writers use words that would only make sense if the, auth if the books were au authored during the time and cultures they claim to be written in. So in conclusion, we've seen the number of bi biblical manuscripts available to us today is far more than any other text from antiquity. This means we can make many kinds of comparisons to see uh, if the Bible we ha have in front of us is correct. And the result is a resounding yes. The Bible has survived the test of time. We've seen the earliest copies of the manuscripts are significantly closer to the date of authorship than any other book from the time. And this, of course, greatly reduces the number of possible <coughs> errors which can be in introduced. We've seen how the, the quotations from early um, Christian fathers allows us to verify we still have an accurate copy of the Bible, as we can re could reconstruct the entire New Testament 
except for 11 verses from uh, the Christian fathers. We've seen how other records of, of the time confirm that the Bible is historically accurate. That's um, based on the names of kings and other features. We've seen how the scribal tradition greatly protected the Bible from errors from the copy, copying and copying over the centuries. And we've had a uh, short look at the common linguistic proofs and arguments and common criticisms and how they easily, uh, easily crumble when they are scrutinised. And thank you for listening. <laughs>